Well, good morning and welcome to this Mother's Day's weekend. Uh, we want to um, just celebrate all the mothers in our, our family and to hope that you have a, a blessed and a happy Mother's Day. We're going through the life of David, the latter stages, and we've come to the end of Second Samuel today, uh, chapter 24. We're going to be looking at a what for many people, as we read this, it's a, it's a troublesome passage, chapter 24. But in it, I, I find such a, a revelation of, of God's heart, His character, ultimately Messiah. And so I've entitled today's message, uh, Redeeming the Mess. So let's, let's give this time over to the Lord and just enter into prayer. Father, I thank you for the revelation of your son, Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that you have not been silent in that, but Lord, that uh, lovingly and delightfully you have revealed him to us. So we're going to be looking at this passage today, and I just pray that there would be just a wondrous unfolding of yourself to all those that are, are listening and watching today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So if you want to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24, we're going to begin in verse 1. And it says, again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. So we find here that Joab, one of the only two men really, that can probably look David in the eye and tell him, David, you're wrong. Um, he, he does so in part here. He confronts David saying, this is not a good idea. But, but David overrides Joab's concerns. And nine months goes by as the, the census is unfolding and it's taking place. And if we drop down to verse 10, we find it says, but David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people and David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you, choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before the, your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer, answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people of Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. Now, David recognizes the sin of this moment, and he comes before the Lord and and he repents, actually, before the Lord even confronts him. And the Lord lays out for him three options. Um, payment, there's a, there's a judgment that's going to unfold in his life. And David does something, I think, here that it's, it's incredibly wise. He, he falls back into the mercy of God. And he says, I'm not going to decide. You decide, and I'm going to rely upon your, um, your kindness, your faithfulness, your mercy. A very wise decision, I think, that David made there. But David makes that statement, I have sinned greatly. And, but we're not told 
what the nature of David's sin is. And so we're left with this pondering, wondering, what exactly was the nature of David's sin? And why was the counting of the number of men, uh, this census of those who were of age to be in the military, what was so grievous about this? And why was this such a great sin? Now, again, Scripture doesn't tell us the reason why specifically, so we're left to conjecture and we're left to speculate, and so we're going to do so today. But I want to suggest to you that there's a lot of counting in Scripture. There's a lot of numbering, a lot of censuses being taken. We have an entire book of the Bible called Numbers, that re- which really reflects that, that, that counting people and the numbers of of people and tribes. And so why is it, though, that this particular counting is such a a grievous sin? Well, I want to suggest to you that any time we come upon something that we find to be harsh, 70,000 people died because of David's sin. And we, we look at that and we say, why was God so, why was he so harsh in this? And uh, what I want to suggest to you, that any time that we see this and we're left to ponder that, um, there's likely an element of touching God's glory, and in particular, touching the glory of his son. Now, if you remember back uh, Moses, Moses was instructed by God to strike the rock and to bring forth water for his people. And he, he does so in, in, in Exodus and and we, we, we see that in Corinthians, as Paul reveals to us, that that rock was a foreshadowing of Christ. And some many years later, Moses again is called by God to bring forth water from a rock. But remember that he was asked to speak to the rock. And in that moment of frustration, Moses strikes the rock again. And we we find that God's judgment came upon Moses. And Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land. And we're left to speculate and wonder, why was God so harsh in this? Why was that such a a huge deal? And we, but we, when we look at through the lens of Christ, the the light of Christ, that rock was Christ. And, And Christ was struck once by humanity. And that was at the cross. But Christ is to never, ever, ever, ever be struck again. When we ask for the living water, the, the, the Holy Spirit to be poured out into our lives, we ask. We never, we never strike again. Moses violated the, the foreshadowing of Christ. In, in such, he touched the glory of God's Son. Well, perhaps David, here in this census, is putting his trust in the security of an army rather than in God. That, that's typically the answer that I've always uh, heard as to what the sin, the nature of the sin. But I, I don't know that that's the case, and I think there's a better explanation for it. In the, in the ancient world, censuses, the counting of people, was often done for other reasons than militarily. Um, we find at the time of Jesus' birth that a census was being taken, they were counting people. And the purpose wasn't military, it was taxes. And so we see that. And closely related to that is when um, a king or a government would want to in- undertake a large building project, they would do a census to be able to find the numbers of working men. And then they would conscript them into the, the service, the working, the building of, of whatever project it was. So we find that Solomon also calls for a census. And this was four years after the death of David. And so we're talking about a period of maybe only 10 years after David's calling for accounting, a census of the people. So if you turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 17, we read this. Then Solomon counted all the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel after the census of them that David his father had taken. And there were found 153,600. 70,000 of them he assigned to bear burdens, and 80,000 to quarry in the hill country. 
and 3,600 as overseers to make the people work. So we find here that, well, Solomon does the exact same thing his father did only, like I say, 10 years earlier, but there is no judgment. There's no plague. There's no death. So why is it that what, when Solomon does it, it's okay, and when David, his father, does it, it's, it's not? You know, is God unpredictable? Is he, is he fickle? Is he, you know, someone that we, we can't trust in, in how he's going to react? Well, I, I don't believe so at all. I don't think that God is unpredictable in the least. Now, when we look back at David's life, what we find is that David has this deep-rooted, long-standing dream to build a house for God. Now, if you remember back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we're not going to go there today, but David has been dreaming for some time on this, this subject, and he calls Nathan the prophet to him, and he, he tells Nathan, look at, look at the house I'm dwelling in, and, and then look at God's house. It's, it's still a, an old tent. And, and how is it that God would live in that place when I live in such um, luxury and, and glory? Um, and so he has this desire to build this, this, this house, this temple for, for God to honor him. And, and Nathan the prophet tells him, God's hand is with you. David, do it. Do it. Well, that night, God appears to Nathan in a dream and and tells Nathan, go back to David and tell him he's not to build that house. I will make him a house. He's not going to make me a house. Now, so this dream, and it's unfolding. And if we take a look at 1 Chronicles chapter 22, and this is as David is handing off his dream to his son Solomon. And it gives us some instruction, some insight into why he was not allowed to to build that house for his beloved Lord. In verse 6, it says, Then he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of Yahweh my God, the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Now, here's the key that the reason why David was not allowed to build this house, this temple in honor of God, is that the temple of God can only be built by the Prince of Peace. And God is pointing out to David, you break the foreshadowing. The Prince of Peace is the one who will construct the temple, my, my house. Now, do you know what Solomon's name means? It comes from the Hebrew word shalom, peace. It's, it's the man of peace is what Solomon's... He, Solomon is a reflection of Messiah, the Prince of Peace. And so it... it the honor of constructing this temple, this house to the Lord in Jerusalem, it falls to the man of peace, to Solomon. Now, if you look down at, to continue looking at First Chronicles 28, I want to read verses 11 to 13. It says, Then David gave Solomon, his son, the plan of the vestibule of the temple. And, and, and he's, he's David has had this architectural drawings put together, and he's, he's sharing them with Solomon. And I want you to see the, the um, excitement in, in David, the, the amount of time and the amount of thought, hours and hours and hours, dreaming of this house, of building this, this temple for the Lord. And so he, he gave Solomon, his son, that architectural drawing and of its houses and its treasuries, its upper rooms and its inner chambers, and the room for the mercy seat. You know, he's got it all laid out, and you can see him, look, Solomon, this is how I envision it, how it's going to be. And, and the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord, all the surrounding chambers. You know, he's got architectural drawings for the rooms where the priests are going to live and, and stay as they're ministering to the Lord. These are going to be their, 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 their rooms where they're going to sleep. And he's got it all laid out beautifully. 
And he talks about the treasuries of the house of God and the treasuries for the dedicated gifts, for the divisions of the priests and the Levites and all the work of the service in the house of the Lord, for all the vessels for the service in the house of the Lord. We're not going to take the time to read it, but he begins to talk and describe to Solomon, show him, look, this is how the, 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 the candle is going to look. And this is the amount of gold that's going to go into this, this, this candle to make it. I mean, he's got it down to the smallest detail laid out and planned. If we drop down to verse 18, he says, For the altar of incense made of refined gold in its weight, and, he, and then he showed him his plan for the golden chariot, this, this chariot made of gold. And in the chariot, two cherubim, it says, that spread their wings and they cover the ark of the covenant to the Lord. The wings overshadow the, 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 the throne of, of God where God himself seats. And it's, David's thought this all through and it, it's like you can see the excitement, the um, and, and it's, this isn't something, again, that David has just put a small measure of thought into. He spent hours, hundreds of hours, maybe even into the thousands of hours dreaming of this plan. In First Chronicles 22, 14, as, as, again, David is sharing with his son Solomon about the temple. Verse 14, he tells him, with great pains... That word pain is, means with, with, with much sacrifice, I have dreamed of this temple. And he, he says, you know, uh, I have provided with great sacrifice, with great pains for the house of the Lord, a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, and bronze and iron beyond weighing, for there is so much of it. Timber and stone too, he says. I have provided these. But then look at what he says to Solomon. He says, to these you must add. It's not glorious enough. It's, it's not big enough. I want you to do even more, Solomon. This is, nothing is too, too great for his Lord. He, he wants to bless God so badly. This is the dream of his, his heart. You know, David has done everything but build that temple. When Solomon takes over as king, Solomon begins construction four years in, into his reign, four years after his dad's death. But, but David has already laid out everything. Solomon just has to build it. He just has to put it together. So this question that I have for us today is simply this. What if, what if, this is speculation I know, but what if the reason in David's heart for that census wasn't about preparing for war? but was preparing to build. What if, if, if the reason why he was wanting to number people is actually he was preparing to build? And I, I can see the, the thought processes going, you know, he has such a heart, this temple. He wants to, he wants to build this so badly. And I, I can just see him, God, I'm not going to finish it. I'm just going to start it. You know, I'm just going to start it. You know, Solomon can finish it. But you know what would have happened if, Sol if David would have started the temple and Solomon would have, it would have been David's temple. We, we, it wouldn't have been called, we wouldn't have remembered it as Solomon's temple. It would have been David's. And once again, I want to suggest to you that that, that violates the, the, the foreshadowing of Messiah. And it's, it would have been a touching of God's glory. Have, has the Lord ever told you no on something Something that you really, really dreamed of doing, that you really wanted to do? And if so, how did that play out for you? How did you, how did you navigate that? Did you, did you chafe over that? Did you, was it something that you just, I'm going to do it anyway? You know, that's, unfortunately, I think that's how humans tend to do, you know. It's, it's that we just, I know, I know God, but I want, this is my dream. I want to do this. My, my point for you today here that I want is that God's no is always about fulfilling your dreams. That's going to sound, but it's, God's no is always about fulfilling your dreams, but your dreams in his. It's a, it's a submitting of your dreams and finding them in, in his unfolding of his plans, his wills. It's as if God says, I have dreams that are much bigger for you. To pursue God's dreams, and as you do that, 
there in, in that pursuit, you always find your own dreams. You always find the thing that, that your heart longs for and desires for. Did you know that uh, building a temple to honor God uh, was not a bad idea? It was a beautiful idea. It was an, uh, David's heart was to honor the Lord. But, you know, in that, I can't help but wonder about Satan's voice coming into David. And, and, and Satan, has God really said to you that you shouldn't build that temple? You know, it's the same voice in the garden. Has God really said that you shouldn't eat of that tree? You know, has, has God really said that you, you shouldn't do that? Well, turn back to Second Samuel 24 and verse 1 where we began. There's a verse here that is just very troubling. And it challenges me, and it's probably you've wrestled over it as well. But in verse 1, it says again, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. Now, has that verse bothered you in the the way it has me? That, That word incited means to mislead, to entice, to allure, to seduce. And and the key is there is who is that he that is inciting? Because in this passage, as you read this verse, it implies that God is the one who is misleading, that God is the one who is enticing David into a place of sin. But we find that in, in James chapter 1 and verse 13, that it reveals that let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Um, these two verses would seemingly be in collision course with one another. And thankfully what we find is that in Chronicles we actually have a parallel passage. And it reads this way. In First Chronicles 21 and verse 1. It says, then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, go and number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report. that I may know their number. Do you see that? The he we discover is actually Satan. It's, it's, It's not God that is inciting David. And thankfully, we have chronicles to tell us who that that he was. But there's a principle that I would like to to share with you today. And it's it's simply to let the clear things of of God give light to and inform the things that are unclear or dimly lit. We always move from a place of clarity to a place of of unfolding and understanding those areas of Scripture that that are hard to understand. Now, we find in Jesus that he is the perfect revelation of the Father. He is the perfect light of God. So it's in and through Jesus that we always read Scripture. We read Scripture in light of the greater light. And that's a principle that we should always apply. So when we come to this Scripture and we, we, we find in, in 24 and verse 1 that we, we find that God is in a very poor light, it seems, that God is, is inciting David to sin, I, w- I want you to just always remember to read Scripture in light of Christ. God is a good Father, a good Father. So I want to then take on the, this um, subject that we began today, redeeming the mess. How does God redeem this mess, this judgment, this plague of 70,000? We, we, we serve a redeeming God, and I want you to see that today. So in Second Samuel 24, I want to read verses 15 to 17. So it says, So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, The Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, it is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? 
please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Now, there's a couple things here. In verse 15, it's interesting because it says that the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from morning until the appointed time. Now, that's three days and three nights of judgment. Now, that's a very interesting thought. I'm sure you're seeing the parallels. But it says that until the appointed time, the Hebrew word there is moed. And and a moed is typically um, used to speak of the feasts. And if I was a a betting person, and, and I'm not really, but I would double and triple down on this moed, this appointed time being the Passover. I, I, I would stake a great deal on that. This, this is the Passover. And it, there's a foreshadowing, a beautiful foreshadowing taking place here. Now, I want you to also notice that David actually sees in the spirit that angel and that the pestilence, this plague that is killing so many, 70,000 people in three days. You know, and I can't help but see the parallels to this coronavirus, you know. I was looking at the statistics yesterday, and we've lost in the U.S. 75,000 people. So it's, it's roughly the same numbers, although Israel was a much smaller nation, much, much less in people, in only three days' time. This is a huge, huge, um, devastating loss, this, this judgment. I want you to see that. Now, something else, as David looks at that angel with that sword, that that death angel. Now, he has the heart of a shepherd. After all these years, he still has that heart. And he says to the Lord, he cries out and he says, but these sheep, these sheep, the people of Israel, of Judah, what have they done? Let your judgment fall upon me. Let, let, Let it fall upon my family. But please, Lord. We, we find there the heart of God. Just David is, is magnificently revealing the heart of, of the true shepherd, Jesus. And, and, and I marvel at that. I marvel at his reaction. Now, the thing I want you to note here is that this angel of death was stopped at the threshing floor of this Aruna, this man who was a Gentile, a Jebusite. Now, we continue reading in verse 18 to 25. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming towards him. And Aruna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And when Aruna said, Why is the Lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruna said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. You know, Aruna, I'm sure he was like, you've got it, David. If this is going to stop this plague from, from coming over my house, from coming, it's yours. I give it to you. I, I gladly give it to you. But David's response to Aruna was, no, but I will buy it from you at a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, that costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Now, I want you to notice again, the angel of death could not pass beyond this threshing floor. Now remember the Passover, the the Moed, that appointed time of God in that moment in Egypt at the, at the first Passover, the angel of death could not pass beyond the doorpost that had blood upon it. The angel of death was stopped by the blood. Now, the principle is that only the blood of a lamb can stop this angel of death in its tracks. 
But I want you to notice, there's no, there's no blood here. David hasn't even performed a, a sacrifice yet. The significance of that, I, I believe, is found actually in, in Second Chronicles. And, and this is just marvelous. But in Second Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, when Solomon begins to build the temple, it records this. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Now, Aruna and Ornan, it's talking about the same household. You know, there's a good chance that Ornan is probably Aruna's father. Um, there's oftentimes the, the father, if he was aged, it would be the son that would be running. It, it, this is the same place that David buys that, in, that we read in chapter 24 that that God stops that angel of death. He stops at that threshing floor, which is where Solomon constructs and builds the temple. That threshing floor is, is the temple mount. When Jesus came into the temple in his ministry, he was coming onto the, 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 the hill of, of Aruna. It's where the temple was built. It's this land that David bought from Aruna. Now, what I want to ask us to do is just to stop and just to begin to marvel, actually, at at God's unfolding of his plan of redemption for humanity. Yes, 2 Samuel is a story of judgment. But can I suggest to you that it is so much more than that? That even more, it's a story of God's redemption, his plan for salvation of humanity. We find here that in the middle of God's judgment, this, this beautiful and exquisite unfolding of his revelation, his, his plans for salvation, for humanity. Now, there's, a, there's another piece to this that I, I want us to, to see here that is in, important. And remember in Genesis chapter 2, 22 and, and verse 2, where Abraham is given this instruction from the Lord to take his son, his only son Isaac, whom you love, your beloved son, and go, he says, to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Now that word mountain, um, they're not mountains as we think of mountains. These are hills. They're rolling. It's it's on the knoll. It's on the, 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 the this high point somewhere. And he says that there is a precise place that I'm taking to you, the one that I will show you. And there you are to sacrifice your son, your only son, your beloved son Isaac. That threshing floor of Aruna was where the cross stood. It was known by many names, Golgotha, Calvary. But that's the place that that, um, the angel of death stopped. And he stopped the blood of Jesus Christ was already testifying a thousand years in advance of the, of the cross, but that angel had to stop. That had to stop there at, at that place at the cross. Now, David, he has this dream, this yearning to build a temple for God. And we find here that, yes, David, he, in a sense, he, he got spanked. Um, he was getting ahead of God's plan of redemption, for, and he was touching the glory, as it were, of the Messiah. But even in this, in this punishment, this judgment, this spanking, God is revealing to David something that is precious. He's revealing him to the location of where his dream is to be built. I want you to ponder for a moment that, you know, God had only revealed the precise location of the cross, the precise location of where the victory over death is going to be won. The salvation of humanity is going to occur here. Only other one person, Abraham, the friend of God. David becomes the second. Even in judgment, do you realize that God is is loving David, is honoring his dream? He's just saying, I want you to dream and I want you to do it in the way that I that I've asked you to carry it out. He's not stomping on David's dream. He's actually fulfilling it. He's refining it. He's growing it into something even more blessed and more beautiful. That's the way of God. 
in judgment, we find God is always advancing his story of redemption. You know, most of the messes that have come about in my life have been because of my trying to advance my dreams, my way. And, and I have not been submitting my, my dreams, my, my, my life, my agendas to his. And in it, I find that I, I create messes. I create sin and, and destruction. But the wonder of wonders is that God takes my messes and he, he redeems them. And even in his correction, he lovingly reveals himself to me. And, and that's the, the wonder of wonders is that God is a God of redemption who takes all that we seemingly destroy and he turns it into something actually of revelation of himself. So David, as we close, he said something to Aruna that day that was far more prophetic than David probably could have ever imagined. And we read that in in 2 Samuel 24 and verse 24, where he tells Aruna, he says, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that costs me nothing. In God's beloved son, he offers up a sacrifice that cost him dearly. An unimaginable price was paid. And it was paid so that we might have life and have it abundantly. And today, through Christ, we receive the riches of God's grace, a gift, an offering of his love. And what I want to invite you today is to give him your mess. If you're living in that place of mess, sins of your own making, I want you to see God through the light of not the judge, but the loving Father, the Redeemer, the one who is wanting to take your messes and give you in its place an invitation to see him, an invitation into relationship, an invitation to revelation of himself. Jesus, as he was speaking to Nicodemus in John 3.17, you remember the words that he told him, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in an order that the world might be saved through him. Today, God invites you to come and discover life as it was meant to be. Shall we celebrate that together? Lord, I just thank you and praise you for your goodness. I I honor you and I glorify you. Lord, you are so magnificent, and the revelation of your Son. Even in judgment, Lord, you're always looking to to make something beautiful from it. And Lord, we come to you with such messes of our lives and, and knowing that we can never make them right. We can never make them into something beautiful at all. But I thank you for Christ. In him we find such an unfolding of beauty. Lord, I pray for anyone that may have not that revelation that of you, that do not have a relationship with you, Lord, I pray that there would be a revealing of yourself to them. And Lord, that there would be a entrusting of them to your heart, knowing, Lord, that you are good. And Lord, that there is an invitation to true fellowship, to true beauty. And in your dreams, we find ours. Thank you, Lord. Amen.